Well, let me just say happy Father's Day. And as we are celebrating Father's Day, let me immediately set a high bar for all of you dads out there. And hopefully this is true for everyone, but let me speak for just a moment specifically to you dads. May we be most famous in our own homes. Would you make that your personal challenge? I want to be most famous in my own home. I want to be respected most by those who know me best. There you go. I told you, I'd just start off with a bang and I'm going to set a high bar. Would you strive to be respected most by those who know you best? Would the people in your own family, would your kids look up to you more than anyone else in your life? Because they know you better than anyone else and what they know about you causes them to respect you more than anyone else. Now, before you start feeling guilty and you start thinking about all the ways that you've let your kids down or you haven't lived up to that high bar, let me just jump right in and say, yeah, me too. Yeah, I have some pretty epic moments where I've had to go to my kids and admit some deep flaws or failures. Some profoundly embarrassing moments and one of, I remember in one of those moments when I was just sharing with my, particularly with my daughters, and one of them just said, Daddy, I respect you more because you shared that with us. Because the way you've handled that, wow. I can tell you that in that moment, it almost brought tears to my eyes to think that here I was admitting a, a failure, something I had done wrong. And they said, Daddy, I, I respect you more because of that. What, what you think is a flaw May, may be a feature in your life. But, but we live in a, a world and a culture that has no regard for honor, no regard for character, no regard for integrity. And, and as a result, the ends justify the means. Meaning you do whatever it takes to get what you want to get. If you have to cheat, if you have to cut corners, if you've got to um, you do immoral or unimaginable things to get where you want to go. Well, that's your truth and you can do what you want to get there. Embrace your desires and just run after your goals. And it doesn't matter what the cost or who it hurts in the process, you can just do it. But here's the challenge. Without character, you and I are building a sandcastle life. And without integrity, others will put the weight of their life on our life and find that it collapses into the sand. So we need both character and integrity in a world that has little regard for character, integrity, value, and honor. So what does that look like? Well, I want to, I want to like, I don't know about lower the bar, but at least lower it for a moment by introducing you to somebody who, quite frankly, would not typically be held in high regard as a man of character. Now, he, he wrote portions of the Bible. I'm going to introduce you to a guy named David, King David, often known as one of the greatest kings of the nation of Israel. But when you think about character and integrity, David would not score high. He wasn't a good dad. Um, in fact, he had to go to battle against one of his sons who was trying to take over the throne. Uh, there's plenty of stories about how some of his kids turn against other ones. Uh, so, you know, he's not, not, not a great dad. Um, he had some pretty dark moments, but let's just look briefly at the progression. He went from being a lowly farmer, uh, and, and that's not me putting farmers in. He was known as a, a, you know, he was a shepherd following a few sheep. And then he goes to battle and fights a giant and he gets promoted to becoming a great warrior. He becomes a commander of the nation, uh, leading the armies of the nation of Israel into battle. Uh, he, as a result, the king, King Saul, becomes jealous of David, fearing for his throne and wanting to protect his, his family's lineage as ruling the, you know, the throne of uh, Israel. Saul began to hunt David down and try to kill him. So, so David goes from being commander to being outlaw. But then he, he marries one of the daughters of King Saul, and so he becomes a son-in-law. And then he goes back to being hunted by Saul again, and now he's an outlaw again. And Saul dies in a battle, and David gets promoted to becoming king. David, when he takes over as the king, 
He begins to establish his throne, his kingdom. He, be, he begins to just dominate on the battlefield and he's seeing incredible success. And there it is right there. In a, in a season where he begins to experience tremendous success, he becomes most vulnerable. I will tell you, the dangers to your character will rarely happen in the most challenging seasons. Yeah, you, you may be vulnerable to fatigue and the dangers that can come from stress and fatigue, but often it is our success. It is our, it's the times when we feel like we're winning and we're doing well that pride can step in and, and begin to put cracks in the, in the foundation of our character. It, it's when overconfidence and arrogance can begin to seep in and begin to bring um, deceptive seeds that get planted into the fertile soil of our own hearts. And, and so actually it's success and good times. And when things are going well, the often we become most vulnerable. And that's David's story. Uh, if you jump into the historical account of his life as recorded by the author of First Chronicles, you, you have this story, it's, and we're going to jump into First Chronicles chapter 21, where it just reads this way, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David. Now, it, it's interesting that the author immediately attributes this situation to Satan, and, and, and it's true, right? Sometimes when we do wrong things, people want to blame Satan. But the truth is, yes, there is an intelligent evil plotting against each one of us, but very often, it really doesn't even have to be Satan. It doesn't have to be an intelligent evil fighting against us, sometimes we set ourselves up for failure. But let's keep reading. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab, his commanding officer, and to the commanders of the troops, go count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan, and then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. Now, what's the problem with this? Because that doesn't seem like a big deal. You, you would, I mean, we take a census every 10 years. Uh, it would seem perfectly normal for a king who's a commanding general to want to know how many soldiers he has, how many fighting men he has. And that's exactly what this census was about. Well, here's the thing. There's a specific can, uh, command earlier that specifically tells kings never to count the fighting men of Israel. And there's a specific reason for that. What God was doing was he's saying, I want you to trust me, not yourself. You take up a big census, it's going to make you arrogant and overconfident. You're going to start to trust your ability based on how many fighting soldiers you have, rather than trusting me to win your battles for you, rather than trusting me to fight through you. And so God was challenging kings and future kings to never put their confidence in themselves, but to dig deeply in trust of God to fight the battles. Why? Because God can do more with a few than we can do with many. Now, that's not the way it always was for David. Interestingly, if you go back before this moment, David wrote a song about this. In fact, uh, it's recorded in the book of Songs or the book of Psalms, which you know, some of you are very familiar with the psalm, like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, what's interesting about the psalms is they were kind of like the nation of Israel's hymnal. And so David wrote some of these songs to be sung by the people. He's putting lyrics in their mouth. Well, listen to one of these songs. It's Psalm chapter 20, written by David to be sung by all the people. And he's leading them in this song. And it, and it says this, he's, I, I'm just gonna read a few of the lyrics. May he, God, give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. It, it, right there, right off the bat, David is saying, it's God who gives you the desires of your heart. It's God who causes your plans to succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory. I mean, may all of us celebrate the victories God gives you and lift up our banners in the name of our God. A banner was what you would, you would lead into battle. We, we lift our banner to God. We say, God, it's you who gives us victory, who gives us triumph, who, who gives us good success. May the Lord grant all your requests. So again, he's leading the nation to sing. God, may, may, may it be God that grants all the requests of his people. And then in this verse, he specifically says this. Here's just a quick line of the lyrics. 
Some trust in chariots and some in horses. These are, these are, that's like saying some trust in their, in their fighter jets and some in their tanks. But we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. What is David saying in this psalm? As he's leading the, the people to sing it, he's saying, we, we don't put our trust in anything of our own. We put our trust in God. We, 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 when we sing, we're singing that God goes before us. It's God that gives us victory. It's God that gives us good success, not ourselves. And, and now you fast forward to another moment where instead of taking that posture, David's going, let me count up all the people. And in fact, Joab tries to warn him. Verse three and four, but Joab replied, may the Lord multiply his troops a hundred times over. May God give you way more than you could ever imagine. May God, may God expand your army a hundred times. Think about in your situations where you're starting to put confidence in yourself. Joab would have said to you, may God increase your bank account a hundred times. May God expand your, your wisdom a hundred times. Would he expand your skills a hundred times? Stop trusting yourself. God can give you way more than you could ever imagine. My Lord, the King, are they not all my Lord's subjects? Why does my Lord want to do this? Why should he bring guilt on Israel? When you trust yourself, when you expose flawed character, you're hurting everyone. Right, dads? When, when you fail, it hurts the whole family. Right, employers? You, you cut corners, and it hurts the whole company. There's some of you that you've been put in positions of leadership and influence. When you cheat, when you cut corners, when you do the wrong thing, when your flaws, when the flaws of your character come out, it doesn't just hurt you. It doesn't just hurt a few people. It hurts a lot of people. And that's what Joab is warning David. David, you're going to bring guilt on the whole nation. And then it says, the king's word, however, overruled Joab. David's flawed character overrules the warnings and the cautions of his greatest advisors. Some of us have run over the warnings of other people. And there's a, there's a, there's a principle that should jump off the pages because here's the thing. Here, here's what I want you to catch. David had a deep belief in God. David led the nation in worship, celebrating how much they trusted God. He had deep beliefs that were not aligned with his behaviors. And here's what happens. When your beliefs are not aligned with your behaviors, you make decisions that change the course toward a different destination. You end up somewhere you didn't want to be. And often where you end up, where you didn't want to be, is not at all where you plan to go or the course you set. But because your beliefs said this, but your decisions aimed you that way, you had a different destination. So how do, we, how do we get this right? How do we learn from David's failure in order to align our character with the right way of living? So let me give you a key, a key takeaway from this passage. Develop character by matching your beliefs with your behaviors. Develop character by matching your beliefs with your behaviors. Can you just take a moment right now? Where do your behaviors not match your beliefs? That what you're saying doesn't match what you're doing. What you deeply feel, what you feel about God, what you feel about the church, what you feel about generosity, what you feel about uh, service or selflessness or sacrifice, it doesn't match how you're living. What God wants to do in your life is he wants to develop in you character so that it's his character in you, rather than you building on your own capacity, your own strength of character? Would you build on the solid rock foundation of character rather than the sand of your own aspirations, your own accolades, your own achievements, your own titles and trophies? Meaning you can build on yourself or you can build on God. God can form the character of your heart or you can let all of your efforts and attempts form the character of your heart. 
Here's the thing. When we get it wrong, we get it deeply wrong. It's kind of like pouring a fractured foundation. And so if you go right back in the story, verse seven, here's, here's what it says. This command was also evil in the sight of God. So he punished Israel. The whole nation is going to suffer because of flawed character in the king's life. And that's how it works, right? People of influence affect others. And, and the key here is that there is something under the surface at a, at a character level. But what's interesting is character is not even the foundation. Do you know that? Your character is not the foundation of your life. No, there's one layer deeper and it influences character, right? Because even a foundation is laid on something. Huh, what's it laid on? In your life, it's laid on your spiritual foundation. What's under your character is your spirit. The problem is you and I, the spirit we were born with was quicksand. I mean, no matter how deep you go, it's just quicksand. It's just crumbling. It's, it's, you can't put anything on it. It will collapse. Why? Because the spiritual foundation is anchored, but that's the wrong word, right? It's not anchored because of sin. Sin is a quicksand foundation. It's this spiritual decay. It's this spiritual rot that uh, deep in us, we're separated from God, driven toward our own evil desires. That's right. There's this quicksand lack of foundation spiritually in every one of us that drives us away from God toward doing what we want, pursuing wrong desires headed toward a forever far from God. Now, let me turn the corner for a moment because it's crazy. David's mistake, David's failure, David's exposure of deep flawed character and yet this isn't how David's remembered. No, if you jump ahead. So we're going from the Old Testament of the Bible. This is First Chronicles, right? This is before the time of Jesus. Now I want to fast forward and we're going to jump ahead to Acts chapter 13. This is after the time of Jesus. You have all this in between. In here is where you have the story in the life of Jesus, the gospels of Jesus that give an account of his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection. We get to Acts, which is the, the historical account of the church, the early church. You get to Acts chapter 13, and the apostle Paul is preaching about Jesus. And he brings up David, this really flawed guy. And he says this in, in Acts chapter 13, verse uh, 22 and 23. God testified concerning him. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Hey, let's just pause for a moment. Dads, let's make that our desire. Let's be a man after God's own heart. Men, young men, boys that are in the, in, in, gathered with us. Let's strive to be men after God's own heart. But what? He's talking about David. David, who God says, I'm going to look and find a man after my own heart. Really? He will do everything I want him to do. Really? From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. So not only is David known as a man after God's own heart, through David, his children, his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, you go multiple generations. You know who shows up on the scene through the lineage of David? Jesus. What? How could this be? Because your failures do not define you. In fact, the flaws in your character do not, have to be the, do not have to have the final word in your life. And so this is a message of hope, not despair. It's a message that, you know, like, I don't want you to walk up here with your head hung low and feeling discouraged and beat up. Not at all. Whatever is in the past does not have to define you if today you recognize that God wants to remold your character. God wants to make your character in this moment. This was what David saw as his moment of arrival, his, his high achievement of success when pride and arrogance began to set in was actually a valley of character formation. God needed to remake some things in David's life. You may have reached a moment of high success in the workplace only to find yourself in a valley of deep failure in the home. Maybe you, you found great success in a hobby. You, 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 you shot your best score on the golf course. You, you hit that, you finally got that trophy buck or you finally got that achievement you've been aiming for only to see something else decaying 
in the deeper areas of your life, and it seems to go that way. Here's what God's doing. He's trying to take this moment of exposed, flawed character and use it as a formation moment to remake character, not in your image, but in God's image. How is that possible? Well, first you got to deal with the quicksand. The story can't end with David. It has to go to Jesus because only Jesus can deal with quicksand stuff. Where in the inside of you, the deepest part of you, things are falling apart. So what Jesus does is he comes from heaven to earth. He dies on a cross to embrace our sin judgment, our sin failure, our sin shame. He takes the curse of sin on himself. He dies in our place. And imagine Jesus' life like this giant concrete truck with the chute pouring into the quicksand of our deep, in the deepest places of our heart, pouring in footers and foundations of concrete into this deep place where it was, there was nothing but quicksand. And in place, pushing out the, the rock, pushing out the, the weakness, pushing out the quicksand, and in place, pouring in a solid foundation. That's what Jesus died for and rose again. Because, right, Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And in his resurrection, he triumphed over sin, over death, and over eternal judgment. Say, so anyone who believes in Jesus by faith is forgiven this sin rot, this sin weakness, this sin decay is removed and replaced with God's spirit. Hey, so let's pause. Rather than for a moment just talking about character and aligning your beliefs with your behaviors, let's just start with belief. You gotta begin with belief. Are you willing to receive the rock foundation of Jesus in the deepest, most intimate places of your life? Are you willing to open up your life and say, Jesus, would you remove the quicksand and replace it with the rock of your love, your forgiveness, your life? Jesus, I believe in you by faith. I give you my life. I recognize that I can't do this on my own and I need you. If you're ready to make that decision, would you say yes to Jesus right now? You're saying yes to Jesus as your Savior, forgiving you of sin, rescuing your life, giving you a rock foundation. And as your Lord, you're saying, Jesus rules over my life. Jesus is the king of my kingdom. I surrender. If you're making that decision right now and you're saying yes to Jesus, would you let us know? You can scan the QR code that's on the screen. And when you scan it, we encourage you to fill out that form and one of our pastors will follow up with you. Actually, your campus pastor is going to follow up with you. Man, we're so grateful for our campus pastors. Such amazing leaders and pastors. They love you. They're praying for you. And they want to encourage you as you begin this new journey in relationship with God. And by the way, you're saying yes to Jesus and you're saying yes on Father's Day. What a great time. Welcome home. Welcome to the family of God. Now, let us know, and then go let somebody else know. And one of the first things, the first thing we want you to do is say yes to Jesus. Next thing we want you to do is let us know. Final thing we want you to do is let somebody else know. Go tell somebody in your life who doesn't know Jesus, who doesn't go to church, tell them your story. What happened to you today? Go share good news with others who frankly are just living in some bad news. Now, let's jump back into the story of Dave. Now, David, his beliefs were not aligned with his behaviors. You just said yes to Jesus. You have belief. Others of you have said yes to Jesus, but your behaviors are not aligned. This is where character comes in. How do we realign our behaviors with our beliefs? So let's go back into this story and let's examine this a little bit more because there's some important lessons that we can learn right from this story. It's this. Uh, if we go back to um, uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 8, we read this. So th this is the moment where it says that this command was evil in the sight of God, and God said, I'm going to punish the whole nation because of you, David. And the very next verse reads this way. Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing thing. It's a powerful lesson here. Character means taking responsibility. Now, today, I want to talk a little bit more to men than anybody else. 
When your beliefs are not aligned with your behaviors, own it. Take responsibility. Young men, would you cut corners? You take responsibility. Don't blame somebody else. Don't blame your girlfriend. Don't blame your parents. Look, I, I, I get it. We live in a culture where everybody else is, it's everybody else's fault for your flaws. Everybody else is the reason why you've got broken things in your life. Good, fine. We'll acknowledge that. But today, pointing out their flaws as the reason for your flaws still is not going to fix your flaws. So even if we acknowledge that and we point it out, let's now change it. How are you going to fix the flaws in your character? Blaming someone else is not going to fix the flaws. So here's what we got to do. We got to take responsibility for our own flaws. We had to take responsibility for our own mistakes, our own failures, our own broken behaviors. So can I challenge you right now? Real men, take responsibility. You want, young men, you want to grow up and be a man? Take responsibility. Boys, let me challenge you. Become a man by taking responsibility. You can see who's a leader by who's willing to take responsibility. Who steps up and says, that was my fault. That was my bad. I could have done better. Because that means they believe they had an opportunity. That means they believe they had enough leadership or enough influence to have made a difference. Stop blaming everyone else. Stop passing the buck. Stop thinking it's someone else's fault or someone else's problem. Fine. Go to counseling. Get therapy. But at some point, take responsibility for your life, your actions. And you notice that in David. David says, God, it was me. I'm the one that blew it. And, and God's probably looking and going, you think? But no, no, meaning it's obvious to everyone else, but you and I, we try to blame everyone else. We, we want to put it on others. We try to justify it. We, we say, oh, that's their problem. That's, they made me what I am. No, no, stop it. Take responsibility. Listen to me. Reject passivity. We've got a generation of men who have become passive. They become followers rather than leaders. They're, they're following their wife. They're following their children. They're following the bad example of a, of a boss, the bad example of their friends. Can I challenge you men? Step up and be a leader. Reject passivity. Reject waiting for someone else to go first. You step up, work on your character, and lead the way. Let, let's be godly men who reject passivity. We, we've got too many wives in our church that are waiting for their husbands to be godly leaders. That are waiting. We, we got too many people in our community that are waiting for someone to step up and lead. Men, let's be the kind of people who step up, reject passivity, and take responsibility. If, I, if we see an issue around us that's a problem, let's step up. Take responsibility and get involved. Let's stop waiting for someone else to do it and let's start being part of the solution. Okay, I'm done preaching that point. <laughs> that also means though, that when we've blown it, we gotta face the consequences. We gotta be willing to take the consequences. I'd rather take the consequence for my flawed character and own it than to have someone else deal with the mess. Let me face the consequence because at least then I can clean it up and I can fix it. Here's how it works in David's life. You go to verse 17. David said to God, was it not I who ordered the fighting men to be counted? I, the shepherd, have sinned and done wrong. These are but sheep. What have they done? Lord, my God, let your hand fall on me. I don't want my kids to suffer because of my broken character. I, I don't want my, kid, my family to suffer because of my flawed mistakes. I, I don't want anyone else around me to, to suffer because of my sin. God, I'll own it. Work on me. That's taking, that's taking the consequences and the responsibility. Let, let me keep moving. Don't take the easy way out. David could have just let the nation suffer and taken the easy way out. But he says, no, put it on me. Unfortunately, a plague began to break out over the nation. That was the consequence. David is pleading with God. And, and it has this kind of metaphorical picture of this, this death angel that's just devastating the nation. And then it stops at a certain point at the threshing floor of Arona. It says that David sees this and, and, and he goes to Arona and says, okay, okay, I, I got to offer some sacrifice to God right here. 
And, and Arona says, yeah, absolutely. You can have it. You, I'll give you the oxen to, give, to sacrifice. I'll give you the land. And David, this is this important moment. David says, David, King David replied to Arona, no, I insist on paying full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a burnt offering that costs me nothing. David is very aware that taking responsibility means paying the price, paying the full cost. It doesn't mean I have to beat myself up. It doesn't mean I have to take the lashes, but it means I'm not taking the cheap way out. I'm not taking the easy way out. It means usually, let me just give you a quick thought. If you, if you think about this, the right way is usually the hard way. The right way is usually the hard way. You take the easy way. Don't cut corners. Character means that the ends never justify the means. When you have godly character, the means the ends never justify the means. Meaning, it's not just about where you're going, it's about the process of getting there. God is concerned about your character more than just what you're accomplishing. He's, care he's concerned about how you get there, not just where you're trying to get to. So let God work on you in the process. It's not just about the ends, but the means. Some of you think that because what you're trying to do is the right thing, it doesn't matter how you get there. And I don't even know that we think deep. We think deeply about that, but we're willing to cut corners. We're willing to cheat. It's tragic that we live in an era when character and integrity are surprising and shocking. Let's be the kind of people then that regularly shock and surprise others with our character and our integrity. Let's go back to verse 13. David said to Gad, the prophet, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into human hands. David says, I'm going to throw myself before God. If you fast forward to another psalm, song that David wrote in a time of great distress because he had done wrong. He wrote this in Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17. For, he's saying to God, for you do not desire sacrifices or else I would give it. You, you don't delight in burnt offerings. I mean, by me offering animals. Remember, you're talking about an ancient time when that's what you offered. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Broken, submitted. A broken and contrite heart, contrite, surrendered. A submitted spirit, a surrendered heart or will. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Character is strengthened in brokenness. When we, when we don't think that we're all that, success will bring you up to the point where you start to think that it's your, you're the source of your success. You're the source of your good fortune. You're the source of your achievements and accomplishments. And so God will work through seasons in your life to bring you to a place of strengthening your character in a place of brokenness. Brokenness is not the same as woundedness. Woundedness is when we're hurt by our circumstances. Brokenness is when we willingly surrender to God. Would you bow your heart to God? Would you surrender your will to God? Here's what I know. God works most through people that have the deepest brokenness in their spirit and the most surrendered will. Why? Because then they don't take responsibility. Let me mean, no, let me say, <laughs> they take responsibility. They don't take pride. They, they don't take uh, illegal ownership and possession of things that are not theirs. They acknowledge the authority of God. They surrender to the will of God. They're submitted to the way of God. And they're not, taking, they're not taking illegal ownership of things that God has done and is doing in and through their life. So can I challenge you and encourage you? I, I want this to be an encouragement. Let's be individuals who are growing in character as we have our beliefs align with our behaviors. Can I, can I take a moment and just pray over each of you right now? Would you, would, you, would you connect with me in prayer? Would you receive this prayer? I want to pray over you. Heavenly Father, I thank you 
thank you for a, a growing generation of young men that are willing to take responsibility and become men of character, men of leadership, men of influence, because they are yielded to God and willing to become what God wants them to be. God, I'm thanking you for the kind of men that recognize their flaws and failures and are willing to allow you to reform them and reshape them, not into what they could be on their own, but what you are making them to be. God, I pray for a, a blanket of brokenness over our church, of a submitted spirit and a surrendered will. God, would you encourage and would you strengthen us to become more like you in godly character. In Jesus' name, amen.